All right, hello there, everyone, and welcome to the 411 Ground and Pound MMA podcast. We are your weekly look into the wide, wacky, wonderful world of mixed martial arts. My name is Robert Winfrey. I am your host, as always. Yeah, we got a show tonight. A little bit of a time filler, this one. This card is just a lot of time filler, it feels like, so... Uh, before we get going, if you could please interact with the product a little bit, like, comment, subscribe, if that's at all relevant. Star rating, written review, whatever your podcast platform of choice allows you to do. Anything that you can do in that respect helps feed the algorithm a little bit. So, yeah, again, any and all of that is appreciated. If you've done any and all of that, uh, share. Uh, sharing on your social media platform of choice or in person is always appreciated, so... If you know someone that you think would enjoy the show, point them in my direction and let me entertain and or annoy them, depending on, you know, how they go. If you're newer to the show, I hope the person who pointed you here is doing so because you, they think I will entertain or be you know, somewhat useful to you as a... Even if I'm just a voice for you to listen to while you drive to work, you know, whatever that is. Um, if they pointed you in my direction in hopes of annoying you, well, I apologize for your friends having uh, that kind of sense of humor. Yeah, I'll apologize on their behalf. I don't feel bad about that. All right. Uh, on the agenda this evening, UFC on ESPN plus 76. Oy. Uh, and then some news. Because there was no event last Saturday for the UFC. Uh, and, yeah, so news. There's a little bit of news. Nothing, nothing earth-shattering, but some news. So we will talk that. All right. Let's go ahead and get into this, shall we? UFC on ESPN Plus 76. It will start uh, Saturday evening. I believe the prelims start around 10 p.m. Eastern, so 8 p.m. my time. Um, look, if you're wondering why, this card was originally booked for Seoul, South Korea. Um, would have been their first trip to South Korea in... How long exactly? Yeah, let me find out. Uh, bad search terms. There we go. Sorry, looking up Korea, and I forget that um, sometimes the UFC would just headline one with Korean zombies, so that would come up on my search function. Um, okay, the last time they were in Korea was December 21st, the last card of 2019 wherein the Korean zombies smashed the crap out of Frankie Edgar in one round. So, jeez. Over three years? Coming up on four. I mean, not exactly coming out of December, but... Would have been the first trip there in a long time. Um, long time. For whatever reason, that got scrapped. I don't know why... Um, might be some kind of travel restrictions, might be some kind of health restrictions going on in South Korea. I don't know. So, for whatever reason, um, it got moved to the Apex. So, yeah. I mentioned this at the time, I think. Like, that's got to suck. If you were genuinely, like, one of the perks of being a professional fighter is the travel, is getting to see the world. And to go from Seoul, South Korea to the Apex, like, gee, yeah, what a downgrade. Um, and the other reason, it, it was supposed to take place kind of in a prime time spot for South Korea. Hence the time that they were scheduled for on broadcast, and despite shifting the location, that's the broadcast time they have. That's the broadcast time we got. So the yeah the main car is gonna start at like I think 1 a.m. Eastern. And you figure six hours, right? So that's gonna go from like eight to two in the morning my time. That's gonna suck. Um and, and by the way, just very very briefly, I know that all the like European, especially like the British MMA fans, are like yeah shut up we do this every week. I've always had sympathy for that, on the one hand. On the other hand, I'd bet on average you're staying up for better cards than this. Just throwing that out there. Um, we're not only going to be staying up all wonky hours. It's for 
this. A uh, lot of debutantes here. A lot of debutantes. Uh, anywho, your main event in the heavyweight division. Ominous words, are they not? Uh, Derek Lewis will fight Sergei Spivak. Mr. Lewis is 1-3 in, in his last four. He has been stopped pretty badly by Cyril Gan, Taito Ivasa, and Sergei Pavlovich. Now, you could argue the Pavlovich fight was a little, maybe a little early. I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily disagree with, I'm not unsympathetic to that argument. I will say, however, in the, in the same vein and breath kind of thing, um, you can see why the ref stepped in. Pavlovich was, Pavlovich was unloading on him. Um, Tuivasa knocked him out cold. And Gon did Cyril Gon things, so. The only win in that stretch, he stopped Chris Dawkus in a little over three and a half minutes uh, in December of 21. Yeah, winless last year. So, he's kind of trying to salvage what he's got. Um, Sergei Spivak, on the other hand, he's gone, he's got a winning UFC record. In fact, he's 5-1 and one in his last six. His only losses in the UFC, he lost his debut to Walt Harris. I think he took that on short notice. He rebounded by beating Tai Tuivasa, which is a little bit surprising. Lost to Marcin Tabora. Marcin Tabora is a tough fight for your third fight in the UFC. Tabora is not a spectacular fighter, but he's a hard guy to beat. Uh, wins three in a row. Carlos Felipe, Jared Vander, and Alexi Olenek. Loses to Tom Aspinall, not terribly surprising. Um, sucks about that injury to Aspinall because he was looking real good before his knee kind of just gave out in that Curtis Blades fight. And he was looking real good. Then he beats Greg Hardy and Augusto Sakai, so he's taking a pretty decent step up in competition. You could argue, you could argue Lewis is the best guy he's fought. Um... Certainly the high, the biggest name he's fought. So we're... I don't know what to make of Derek Lewis at this point. He's still got power. He's still not the best at setting it up. But it still exists. Uh, he... I don't know, he's... That poor guy's dealt with so many just kind of lingering health issues. Uh... Spivak's more of a grappler. Getting Derek Lewis down is not easy. Keeping him down is also fairly difficult. There's a real physicality to Derek Lewis that even for heavyweights is a bit remarkable. This is a little speculative on my part. I would not bet on this fight, for the record. I think this is way too volatile to feel confident uh, wagering on. Momentum's with Spivak. The question is more about, like, where's Derek Lewis at this point? Spivak is 28. Dang. Uh, Lewis is 37. He's almost nine years. Hang on. February. January. Yeah, almost exactly nine years. Um... Dang, Derek Lewis is my age. Uh, I, I kind of just, I don't know. I, I, I'm not discounting Derek Lewis. Again, he's got power, but he tends to gas himself out or start having to severely manage his energy in ways that aren't always the best. You know, I just I know he's had back issues and just as a minor aside, like if you want to help save your back and you're a bigger guy, the jumping switch kick is not your friend. Just throwing that out there. Not your friend. Um I'm going to lean towards Spivak for a pick. No, I'm not sure about that at all. Again, this is a very volatile fight, I think. So wouldn't feel confident laying a wager uh, at all. 
But I I just think, like, dude, Lewis has been fighting for a long time. Again, not only is he coming up on 40 in a hurry. Uh, sorry, not only is he 30, he's not only 37, he's almost 38. He'll be 38 in, like, a week. Yeah, first week of February is his birthday. So he'll be 38 in, you know, a couple of, a handful of days. He's got, what, 37 fights? It's a lot of fights. And he's been fighting since 2010. So we're 13 years, almost 40 fights, nearly at the age of 40. I'm not saying he, again, I am not saying he can't win this fight. He very well might. Spivak might come out reaching for clinches, uh, you know, pushing and kind of wearing himself out, and he might get chinned. That's incredibly possible. But I I think everything is kind of working against Derek Lewis here in a lot of ways. So he's still got the power, and that's not to be discounted, but I'm... I'm okay picking Spivak. You, you know, Lewis's big path to victory here might be if Spivak is afraid to trade with him. Lewis has actually kind of struggled with guys who are willing to engage with him a lot. Like, guys who will push a decent pace and who aren't afraid of him and make him work, who keep touching him. You know, he's not the best at dealing with that. So, If Spivak is really, like, averse to the, the fire... Uh, Lewis can use that to his advantage. If this were three rounds, I'm, that might swing things in Lewis's favor just a little bit. Over five, I don't know that Lewis is going to hang on for five rounds. I just don't. I mean, it's not like Spivak has some great history of five-round performances either, for the record. I think this is his first. No, he has several... Sorry. He has quite a few five-round fights scheduled. Um during his time before the UFC when he was the champion of a promotion. Those all ended in the first round. He was clearly better than his opposition. But he should, in th- so again, he should in theory have five-round preparations. Lewis has prepared for five rounds a few times as well, but it's the longest Lewis has gone. He's gone to the fourth a couple of times. Um... Once it worked out for him against Shamil Abdurakhimov, once it did not when Mark Hunt bludgeoned him. Okay, if you want, if you ever want to see, like, how do I say this? If you want to see a mean finish, and I don't mean mean like uh, heated, I mean mean just like, oh, why are you doing that? Watch how Mark Hunt finishes Derek Lewis. Like, he throws the kitchen sink at him, and it's just mean. And I don't think there was any real animosity between them either. You know, Mark Hunt, for as affable as he is, uh, when he got rolling in the cage, he was a mean fighter. And I I mean that as a compliment, just for the record. So, yeah, I, I just, I'm, I'm not sure that I can really pick Lewis at this point. But... This is a fight that is certainly winnable for him. I do want to stress that. Uh, But how winnable? eh, I don't know. Uh, All right. Co-main event. Light heavyweights. Daun Jung and Devin Clark. Uh, This card sucks. (laughs) I'm just going to say it. All right. Daun Jung. Um, Not the Iron Turtle. Is he? I think that's a different South Korean. Uh, let me. Yeah, that's not that's not the Iron Turtle. Um. Don't know why I'm con- Don't know why I'm confusing that. Um. Anyway. Uh. Mr. Zhang is 4-1-1 one one in the UFC. There's nothing to sneeze at. He had that wacky draw with Sam Alvey. I mean, it was fair It was fair to be scored a draw, for the record. Um, he's got wins over... He's beaten. 
Let's see, Hadras Ibrahimov, Mike Rodriguez, William Knight, Kennedy and Zechiku. I remember the Zechiku fight. There's a Chukwu. I forget how to pronounce that. I apologize. I always get it wrong. I know I always get it wrong. Uh, he had a rough fight against uh, Dustin Jacoby. He struggled with a guy who was like a real good striker. On the plus side for him, like Devin Clark is not a very good striker. Clark is seven and seven in the UFC. Um, has he ever had a winning streak in the UFC? Yeah, once in 2016/17, debuts with a loss, wins two, loses. You know, Jan Blahovich beat him. That was on Jan's kind of run towards the title. Beats Rodriguez, loses to Alexander Rakic. It was kind of a fun fight. Beats Stozic, loses to Span, beats Townsend. So a lot of guys aren't in the UFC anymore. Oh, he has another one here. Sorry, he beat Townsend. Then he beats Alonzo Menafield. So 2020 at a winning streak. Gets beaten up and choked out by Anthony Smith. Loses to Iwan Kutalaba. Beats William Knight. Uh, was last seen losing to Azamat Mirzakhanov. Mirzakhanov's pretty darn good. Um... I don't really pick Devin Clark to win at this point. I'm going to lean towards Jung. But Clark will test his grappling in ways that I don't think too many other people on Jung's current run in the UFC have. So, something to keep an eye on there. All right. Now let's see. Next up, heavyweights. Two heavyweight fights on the main card. What a ringing endorsement of quality. Uh, Marcin Tabora and Blagoy Ivanov. Dear. Why? Why were you gonna... Were you like... Oh, that's a bad joke. I'm not gonna make it. <laughs> so I'm just, that's That, that would have been a... Yeah, no. But like, why are you doing this to people? Just, why? What did the fans do to you, UFC, that you want to hurt them so? Um, Ivanov won his last fight. He beat Marcos Rogerio de Lima a little less than a year ago in May of last year. Had that split decision lost to Derek Lewis, I kind of thought he won. He lost the Sakai fight, though. I thought that was pretty a legitimate loss. Um, Tabora, Tabora's just kind of a rock-solid heavyweight. I mean... His only loss in his last, what, seven fights? A yeah, six and one in his last seven. Lost to Alexander Volkov. Um, he put a pretty decent beating on Alexander Romanov. Romanov had a lot of hype. This was August of last year. It was actually the uh, UFC 278 card. Uh, Romanov had a lot of hype. Romanov was undefeated going into that fight, if memory serves. But Romanov, as usual, comes out like a house on fire. There was some there was some controversy about that, like whether or not Romanov should have had a 10-8 first. Um, forget how I scored that, but I don't object to uh, Tabora winning. Like Romanov faded bad, did not respect the altitude. Knee fights a little bit crazy for a heavyweight anyway. In terms of like, if he can't get you out of there in the first, it's a lot of all right. Well, here we are. Um. I'm picking Tabora here. Uh, Ivanov's not exactly a dynamic fighter. And if you're not really dynamic, Tabora can kind of just grind you down. Like, uh, he'll wear you out. He'll kind of just... He's good everywhere. So, gonna lean with Tabora there. Featherweight, a good fight. We got to one on the main card. <laughs> the Korean Superboy, Duho Choi and Kyle Nelson. Um, Choi, bless him... He fought some wars in consecutive fashion. Like, his last three fights, uh, Cub Swanson, in 2016, this was right before he went in for the mandatory military service that South Korea has. Um, that fight with Swanson, man, UFC 206, that was the fight of the night easily. That was one of the best fights of 2016. And it got inducted into the UFC Fight Wing Hall of Fame. Uh, last year, actually. Then he comes back from military service, fights Jeremy Stevens. That's a pretty decent fight. Loses. 
That was your main event. He gets stopped in the second. Then he fights uh, Char- um, Charles Jordan in December of that year as well. Uh, gets stopped in the second. Another fight of the night. So dudes had three back-to-back fights of the night in 16, 18, and 19. Why has he been out for so long? Uh, let's see. He was supposed to fight... Supposed to take a step down in competition and fight Danny Chavez uh, July of 21. Some kind of an injury. Pulled, uh, so, so dealing with injuries mostly. Um, fighting Kyle Nelson. Nelson is one in four in his five UFC appearances. His only win is over Polo Reyes, who I do not believe is with the UFC anymore. Yeah, Reyes got cut. Yeah, cut a while ago. Um, nineteen. It was the the Nelson loss that sent him out. So he's kind of doing his thing in smaller fights, if, uh, leagues. So two fight losing streak for Nelson. Losses to Jai Herbert and Billy Quarantillo. Um, I'm picking Troy. Like this seems like a. Again, this was supposed to be in South Korea, so I don't think this is—I don't think Nelson is just a straight-up tomato can. But this does seem like, look, with on his, on the losing streak, Choi's on a step back from fighting, you know, the Jeremy Stevens and whatnot of the world is, is due. Like he, so, but this is—they eh, were giving him an opportunity here, and I don't mean that in the sense that Dana, like, yeah, the UFC's an opportunity. No, no, like you're giving him a fight that's very winnable. So, picking Choi, but we'll have to see how the injury might have worn on him. And again, and some of the wars he's been in, like, those catch up to you. And sometimes they catch up to you fast. Uh, welterweights. Uh, Yusaku Kinoshita versus Adam Fujit. Uh, let's see. Kinoshita is 6-1. and one. Is it Kinoshita or would it be Yusaku? I don't know which is his family name. I'm assuming this is listed here, the traditional Japanese way, which is family name and then uh, individual name. They, they, uh, again, because Japan, China, and I think Korea, they list family names first and then individual names, whereas the Western does it the other way around. So, Uh, just a minor note. So, I apologize if I'm being overly familiar with referencing this gentleman. I'm going to go with Kenoshita because I know that's how that's pronounced. And I'm not entirely sure where the emphasis is and uh, would be in Yusaku. So, going with Kenoshita, because, again, I know how to pronounce that. Uh, Kenoshita is here on the back of a Contender Series win. That was August of last year. Uh, Fujit. And I believe he's lost in the UFC. Yeah, 0-1. Lost to Michael Morales. I vaguely, vaguely recall that fight. That was July of last year. Um, somewhat interesting fight. You're six and one against eight and three. Hmm. Uh, somewhat against convention. I think I'm going to go with Kenoshita. Yeah. Quick look, actually, what the odds might be for this. I don't usually talk about this, but I'm curious to see if they're listed. Uh, For these ones, no. In fact, if we go to the UFC, I mean, you can find odds if you wanted to, but on the UFC's website, we have, I should mention this, I suppose, Sergey Spivak is the favorite over Derek Lewis. Again, these odds are going to change depending on where you are. I'm on the UFC's official UFC website. So whoever they get their odds from, I forget who it is, but they they don't usually vary too much. They will vary a bit, but uh, and for the light heavyweight bout, Da Eun Jung is minus 245 against plus 205 on Clark. That all seems kind of fair. Uh, the rest of these do not have odds listed at the moment, so I couldn't tell you. All right. Uh, let's see. Next up, we have. The other thing about this event, this was supposed to be the final of the Road to the UFC tournament, which I watched none of, but was apparently pretty decent. So I think it's on Fight Pass, if you're curious. So we're going to go through some of these and see what we can 
So first up, we have lightweights. Uh, sorry, I forgot to mention. Duo Troy and Kyle Nelson, featherweight, uh, Kenoshita and Fujit at welterweight. Lightweight here on the prelims, we have uh, Jekka Sari... I'm going to mispronounce this. Where's the gentleman from? Is he Indian? Indonesia. My apologies, Indonesia. The other guy, I think, is Indian. Um, so Jekka Sari... Sarig? I'm going to go with Sarig. And apologize until I know how to properly pronounce that. Um, Saragi? Going with Sarig. I'm just I'm sticking with that again until I know how to do it right. I'm less likely to make a fool of myself. Um, he's got a decent record. He's 13 and two overall. He's on a what five fight winning streak. Knocked out both of his opponents on road to the UFC. Uh, good for him in that respect. Uh, his opponent is Anshul Jub uh, Jubi. J U. Yeah, he. This is the Indian gentleman. Um, Jubli. Sorry. Smaller font. The L and the I right next to each other. Couldn't tell which was uh, if that was two different letters. So Anshul Jubli is undefeated, six and zero. Um. Probably gonna go with Sarig. I think is where I'm gonna lean. I mean, these are two of the better lightweights fighting mostly out of, like, southern and southeast Asia. So, should be a decent one. That that should be a decent enough fight. Uh, and my pick there is, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't bet on that. <laughs> like, All right, featherweights, uh, Jong Young Lee, or Lee Jong Young, sorry, versus uh, Yi Jia. So, we have South Korea and China. Jia Yi is... 21 and 3. It's a good record. Um, where's he fought? Most of his stuff seems to be WLF, which is not a bad organization. Um, let's see. One finish and one split decision on his road to the UFC. Three fight winning streak overall. Not bad. Whereas Jung Young Lee. Is nine and one. Did he fight that many times in the road to UFC? Sorry, that's Road FC. Sorry, slightly different logo. Uh, his road to the UFC, two first round finishes. Not playing around. Whew. Not a bad fight here. Dealing with, like, the number one featherweight in China and the number five featherweight in South Korea, according to Tapology's rankings. Um, I'm actually kind of looking forward to this one, having looked a little bit at what these guys have done, like their streaks. I'm going to go with Ja, I think. Totally. That's tough. This is a real tough one. Actually, I think I'm going to go with Lee. But that's eh, that's not a bad fight. That's not a bad fight at all. Bantamweights. Ooh, bantamweights always fun. Uh, Koshimoi, Kosh, excuse me, Koshimi. Ko. <laughs> Toshiomi. There we go. I got it. Toshiomi uh, Kazama and Rinya Nakamura will be fighting. Uh, both these gentlemen are Japanese. Uh, Nakamura is 6-0, and undefeated, a Olympic wrestler, it looks like. Uh, certainly some level of international wrestler. And that's no joke, man. Uh, the, the, Japanese, the Japanese wrestling program is, it may not have, uh, the men's side of things may not have the success the women's side does. Japanese women wrestlers are monsters. If you've never seen what some of them have done, man, they they will mess you up. So succeeding in that program is not accidental and is uh, that's nothing to sneeze at. Uh, he is again undefeated, six and zero. Oh. Two first round finishes on the road to UFC. Whereas uh, Kazama. 
be fairly decorated. He is 10 and 2 overall. Uh, let's see. Only one win? It looks like he. This tournament structure must have had some weirdness. Uh, like, there's a few canceled fights where the guy who didn't pull out got advanced in the tournament kind of so I, like I said I don't know the format or anything so uh fair amount of stuff in Pancrase and Shudo think I'm going with Nakamura there then we have at what are we at here flyweight couple of South Koreans we have Choi Sung Yuk and Park Hyun Sung now, I know I do a little bit better at uh, pronunciations of this kind of stuff than the stereotypical, perhaps even average American, but I always feel bad because I know I'm screwing it up in some way. There's some bit of the accent that I'm just getting wrong, and I always feel bad about it. Um, anyway, Mr. Park is undefeated, 7-0. and uh, Won both of his road to the UFC... Events via first round finish. Not bad, not bad. Mr. Choi is six and one. Fights out of the Korean Zombies t gym. Both decisions, but both unanimous decision wins in his uh, road appearances. Huh. Again, I'm kind of flying blind, a little bit blind here, but. Park fight out of. So, according, again, Tapology has Park is the number one flyweight in South Korea and Choi is the number three flyweight in South Korea, so. Uh, pretty darn good fight here. I feel like I should lean towards Park. Yeah, all right, let's lean towards Park, but, you know, who the heck knows. Uh, let's see, moving on to women's flyweight. Firefist, Jiyeon Kim. Uh, she is still with the UFC, despite a really not good record with them. Uh, and she's on a four-fight losing streak. Okay, I thought she won. I thought she won the Jocelyn Edwards fight, for the record. That was July of 2022. I thought she won that one. I kind of thought she got a raw deal in the Priscilla Cachuea fight. Remember, I, I might be confusing that with a different Priscilla Cachuea fight that I thought she lost, which is most of them. So, don't quote me on that. She lost... The losses to Alexa Grosso and Molly McCann were perfectly legitimate. Where's the McCann one weird? I forget. So, a couple of her last fights have been ones that maybe she kind of should have won. Is it the... Yeah, I, I, I'm almost positive I scored the Edwards fight for her, but... Anyway, she is fighting Mandy Bohm. Probably mispronouncing that because that's German. Uh, Baum is seven and two. Zero oh and two in the UFC. The losses to Ariane Lipsky and Victoria Leonardo. Bit of a setup for Kim. This is kind of win or go home for Kim, I think. So I don't mind picking her here, but if she can't win this one, it might be time to might be time to let her uh, try somewhere else. Middleweights: Park Jun Young. It's like Jun Young Park. Park is his. Nah. This is the Iron Turtle. Okay. <laughs> this guy amuses me, so that's that's why he, I like his nickname. It sticks in the head, obviously. And his fights, they they're not always great, but again, they kind of amuse me. Um, yeah, Park he got knocked the heck out by Gregory Rodriguez. He's on a two-fight winning streak, though. Wins over Eric Anders and Joseph Holmes. Um, his UFC record is quite good. He's only lost to, I mentioned Gregory Rodriguez, who's very good, and Anthony Hernandez, who's no one to sneeze at. Um, yeah, he's got, he got some decent wins. Marc-Andre Barrios, nothing, again, Barrios a little bit wonky, but you gotta earn those, you earn that win over him. Like, he makes you earn it. And Tafan Chukwi, that was a weird fight. Um... Yeah, it's a weird fight. Uh, Chuck, we couldn't stop hitting Park in the... He <laughs> couldn't stop hitting him in the groin and finally lost points in the last round that cost him the fight. 
Um, he's fighting Dennis Tolulin. Feel okay picking Park there, but... I mean, Tolulin is... He's 11-6, and six, but I feel like he's, what, 1-1 one and one in the UFC? Yeah, 1-1. One one. Coming off a win over Jamie Pickett. But he lost prior to that to Alice Kabab Kirziev. Kizriev, excuse me. Yeah, Alias Kabab uh, Kizriev. I I don't mind leaning towards Park here, but Tolulin's also... He's not quite anything to sneeze at. If you think you're just going to run him over, you'll probably be mistaken. But I'm still going to lean towards Park. And kicking everything off at flyweight, we have Tatsuro Taira and Jesus Santos Aguilar. Um, Tatsuro Taira is a guy I've been kind of beating the drum for for a little bit here. He's undefeated. He's 12-0. and He's 2-0 and in the UFC. Uh, wins over Carlos Candelario and CJ Vergara. He, he did a number on Vergara when they fought. That was October of last year. Um, Aguilar is... He's 8-1. and one. Fought in the UFC before? No, he is not. He's coming in off the back of a contender series win. He's on an eight-fight winning streak. So, no one to real Again, no one to overlook necessarily, but I, I think quite highly of Tyra's abilities, so I'm going to pick him. And that's the event. So, Saturday, late Saturday slash early Sunday morning, I will have coverage of that in the MMAZona411mania.com. On the off chance you care, please do stop by and say hello. I always appreciate it. All right, let's, let's move on here. I don't want to talk about Conor McGregor. I don't especially like talking about him at this point. But he's been in the news. So let's talk about a few things Conor McGregor related, shall we? Apparently the guy almost got hit when he was out biking, like got hit by a car. Um, seems to be okay. So there's that. Um, let's get to the negative first, shall we? So, news broke the last little bit that, you may remember this, there was a little bit of news about it, kind of when it happened, that there was an incident involving McGregor on a yacht, and I believe this was off the Spanish coast. Um, I forget exactly which part of it, so forgive me there, but there were rumblings about an incident. Well, turns out that uh, might be a little bit more to it than that. Like, not just an incident, but the uh, the woman who was kind of part of this equation, uh, She's she is Irish. Like, apparently, if you listen to her side of things, what happened was she and Connor, like, had a mutual friend or, like, some passing acquaintance and ran into each other in Spain. Uh, had a brief conversation, you can, and Connor invited her onto the yacht for the thing, and then Connor, according to her, kind of lost it, um, assaulted her, and to avoid him, she jumped off the yacht and actually had to be, like, picked up by the Coast Guard. Now, for whatever the... Now, I don't know what happened, obviously, but the relevant Coast Guard authorities did confirm that they picked her up out of the water. So um, there's some cre- there's a fair amount of credence to at least something weird going on. Uh, now that she, now that uh, she has now like filed a formal complaint against him, so we'll see what comes of that. Oh, incidentally, uh, apparently her car got burned uh, in Dublin. And people, why are you like this? Look, I'm not, I don't know whether or not these accusations are true, okay? Let me, let me start there. I don't know. The, there's some evidence to support that, again, something went on there. Because people don't jump off of yachts and have to be rescued by the Coast Guard for no reason. Like that, there's, that's not normal behavior, Right? circumstances have to conspire to cause this to happen. Now, maybe they were what she alleges. Maybe they were something else. I don't know. I know that that's not normal. Even in the event that she is fabricating this, I don't think she is, but let's just delve into the hypothetical here. You don't get to commit arson. What's wrong with you people? 
No, maybe, maybe this incident... Maybe her car getting burned had nothing to do with this. I find that highly unlikely, but hey, maybe. Maybe it's just literally the worst luck. Not impossible. Unlikely, but not impossible. But, guys, people, let me just have a brief moment here, because, uh, look, I rag on MMA fans a lot because we deserve it. Let's also not pretend that this kind of behavior is somehow limited to MMA fans. People with a certain level of celebrity status, especially if there's a degree of hero worship, the cult of Khan is a thing that goes along with this. The number of people who will jump to kind of defend or react badly to this kind of information, like, you, you people just... You need help. I, I mean that. You need help. If you heard that this person filed a complaint against Conor McGregor and your response was arson, you need help. Like, straight up. And this is not unique to MMA. This has happened to people who have brought forth allegations against other beloved sports figures all over the world. Uh, they get harassed. They get... Uh, it's a bad thing. Got everyone. I say guys kind of as a gender-neutral term to say everyone in this case. Um, I'm, I'm, let me be very specific here. There's plenty of crazy female fans, too. Let's not pretend this is a uniquely male thing, so just take a second here. People, we need a better response to this. Like, Seriously. One of the big things about victims of assault, especially if there's a, you know, a more kind of like sexual component, I'm not saying there was here, but I'm, if I'm going to talk about this, let's talk about the other elements of this, right? Part of the reason people don't come forward is they fear retaliation. And this is a bad thing, right? If, even if, even if this whole thing is fabricated, that needs to be dealt with through the appropriate legal channels. Not you with a Molotov cocktail. It's important that these accusations come about quickly. Because that provides all the relevant bodies the best opportunity to actually collect evidence. I can't tell you how many times... Over the last little bit, in particular, we've heard stories about someone saying so-and-so did X. Could be any number of things. And it was, you know, years ago. At that point, you get into a situation where there is no evidence. It's your Word. I'm not saying your testimony counts for nothing. I'm not saying that. But everything you say in an investigative sense needs to be corroborated or you can't really use it. I mean, not to potentially dredge up this one, but for the sake of a fairly well-known example of this... Here in the United States a few years ago, when um, Justice Brett Kavanaugh was being put forth for the Supreme Court, there was a woman who alleged that he took part in, a, in a, an assault on her. Now, the problem here is that the alleged incident took place, I believe, in high school. And Mr. Kavanaugh was, at the time, uh, he was in his 60s, I think being put forth for this position. I forget exactly. It's something like that. So, bear with me here. Finding evidence of crime, especially interpersonal crime, like 40 years after the fact is essentially impossible. I mean, even if it weren't even if it's not literally impossible, it, it becomes statistically impossible. 
ultimately resulting in what took place over the course of that hearing, which was largely uh, Dr. Blasey Ford saying, here's my recollection of what happened. Justice Kavanaugh saying, here's my recollection of what happened. And you kind of have to just throw up your hands and go, well, okay, who do I want to believe? I mean, it's sort of, I mean, there was some, uh, there was some, you know, testimony from people who were supposed to be at the event in question that's contradicted uh, Dr. Blasey Ford's recollection of events. And you don't want this. Okay, guys, people, we don't want this. We we don't want people who might have committed these kinds of assaults to wander around free to do it again for years, assuming they're guilty, because that's not good for anybody. Also, if, and this is the other point about this, if you are accused, you would want that to be brought to light quickly because... If you're accused and you haven't done anything, again, like 30 years later, 40 years later, what are you going to say? Like, uh, assume for just a second you're innocent, right? You did not do anything wrong. And a lot of people who listen to this are roughly my age. So assuming you're, you know, north of 30, hypothetically, what if someone from your high school graduating class publicly accused you of something that you know you didn't do. Whatever your age is, just think back that long. Someone says, at this event, so-and-so assaulted me. How are you going to prove that? Like, How are you going to potentially defend yourself? The answer is you're probably, like, what are you going to do? Try and remember things? Like, all you know is, okay, no, I didn't do that. Now you have to try and prove it to one degree or another. Especially in the court of public opinion. Like, actual, the ability to produce reliable witnesses or some kind of evidence to the contrary would be really nice. But we need this stuff to start, to happen as soon as possible so that the process can take place in a timely fashion. This benefits all of us, believe it or not. And when jackasses and felons, arson is a felony, at least here in the United States, I don't know exactly what it would be in Ireland. I'm going to assume it's not looked... I'm going to assume the burning of automobiles is not looked upon favorably by the law. Just a thought. I don't know exactly, but I'm going to guess. You're not helping anything. I mean anything. It's just depressing, man. Like, maybe you think this woman is lying, and maybe you think Connor didn't do anything wrong, and hey, look, I don't know, okay? I don't know about the validity of her claims. I I don't. I'm not sitting here saying Connor McGregor did anything wrong in this instance. I don't know. I'm saying... Reacting like this is bad. And for some reason, I have to say that out loud. Because some people need... It needs to be put out there, I guess. The most self-evident statements in that I can make in this respect. But needs to be verbalized, I guess. And I, and maybe you're listening to this and you're, you're in the Screw Connor camp. Okay. I'd like to think that you'd be reasonable enough that if this happened to, to someone you did like you would not react this way. And take a minute and reflect, please, about how you might react in that situation if someone you did feel very strongly about in this same capacity were accused of something similar. And I'd like to think you wouldn't take drastic, stupid action, but that's not the world we live in anymore. You, apparently, we're no longer safe to make that assumption. But please don't do this. I don't know why this needs to be said, but please, the world's crazy enough.
And things are going downhill in a lot of respects. In a lot of respects, they're better than they've ever been. Like, we have this weird thing going on right now in human society. By most metrics, and I mean this, by most metrics, things are right now better than they have ever been in the entirety of human history. And at the same time, we're losing our minds. Please stop this. I don't know that my words in this instance mean anything. But for whatever value they carry, stop doing this. Conor McGregor does not need you to defend him. He has PR teams. He has an agent. He has a lawyer. Stop it. Just stop it. You need help. Last thing on the Conor McGregor front, rumor has it um, he's going to be coaching this next season of The Ultimate Fighter, which ought to tell you how desperate they are to try and revive that thing. Um, no official word on who he who will be coaching opposite. Again, Tony's saying that he's signed to do it, Tony Ferguson in this instance. <sighs> That's a fight that at this point makes sense. Tony's... God, I hate saying this, because if you missed Tony Ferguson's run when he was one of the best lightweights in the world, do yourself a favor, go back and revisit it. It was genuinely amazing. The best version of Tony would have done a number on Conor. Would have lost that first round, almost sure, almost certainly. But after that, would have come back, and between his just kind of relentless attacks and pressure, he would have carved him up. Um, again, tough first round because Tony, even at his best, would get hit and get hurt, and Connor could do that, but best version of Tony beats Connor, I'm fairly confident. Current version of Tony, I don't know. I don't know that, I, but it is that kind of like wa- slightly over the hill, little bit washed bit of Tony right now that makes him an appealing opponent for McGregor on a losing streak coming back off of a pretty debilitating injury. Like, dude, his leg broke in half. In case you forgot. Like, Tony would make for a reasonable-ish reintroduction. And I'm not happy saying that, and I will not watch a single solitary second of The Ultimate Fighter. I don't care about it one iota. But that seems, that's one of the things out there. So a lot of stuff going on with Connor. None of it, good. Let me just say that. Like, almost, you get hit by a car, that's not good. And the rest of it, yeah. And, and no, for the record, no, I don't consider him coaching the Ultimate Fighter to be, like, the best thing ever. Because the Ultimate Fighter continues to exist, which I don't consider to be of all that, all that valuable. But, eh. All right, um, moving on to something a little bit better. So UFC 287 has taken a degree of shape here. Uh, Consider that a good thing. There was rumor for a bit. Now, this will take place um, April. No venue yet, but April 8th, 2023. There was some discussion that um, Aljamain Sterling and... Uh, what's his face? Henry Cejudo was going to be on this card. Um, which is odd because Sterling himself has been kind of adamant about, no, that's not my recovery timeline. He said, you know, I'll be ready. I think it's more like summer. He'll be ready. So, weirdness. You know, see pressuring fighters in public and whatnot. Nothing new. We do, however, have a main event for UFC 287, the rematch, the fourth overall fight between uh, current middleweight champion Alex Pereira and former middleweight champion Israel Adesanya. I liked their first MMA fight plenty. Um, Adesanya did very well in that fight. Um, Pereira might just have his number in terms of, like, he just might be a bad stylistic matchup for Izzy. Like, it's not that Izzy can't find success. You know, Izzy hurt him badly in their kick, their second kickboxing fight. Like, dropped him. I think it was twice before he got knocked out. 
and he hurt Pereira badly in that first round of their title fight. And, had, you know, look, he'd won uh, three. He, he was up 3-1 going into the fifth. Um, Pereira had the second, I think, but then... And how was the fifth going? Prior to the stoppage, it was a little bit back and forth. I'm not sure who I was given that round to before the stoppage. But the point being, like, Adesanya's not out of that fight. So, I don't object to that. Um, also announced for that card, Gilbert Burns and Jorge Masvidal. Sure. I'm not going to object to that. Um... Uh, yeah, I'm not going to object to that one at all. Uh, what else do we have there? Kevin Holland and Santiago Ponzinibbio. Eh. Raul Rosas Jr. against Christian Rodriguez. They continue to soft pedal Rosas. Bantamweight, good fight here, actually. Rob Font and Adrian Yanez. Heck of a fight. Uh, Joe Pfeiffer gets a opponent he should beat in Gerald Mershart. That's, a, that's not a knock on Mershart, that's a stylistic matchup. Also announced a few other fights. Among them, Kelvin Gastelum and Chris Curtis, which I, I, can, dig, I can get down with that. I can get down with that one. And uh, Cynthia Calvillo, who's got to be on her last legs, against Lupita Godinez. Um, Calvillo had a ton of hype at one point. You remember this? She debuted in the UFC in 2017, won like three fights in the UFC that year before losing to Esparza. What another good run. Wins over Poliano Botelho, Courtney Casey, Jessica I. Um, but she had weight issues. Then loses to Caitlin Chukagian. Jessica Andrade stopped her. Uh, Andrea Lee stopped her. They stopped that fight between rounds two and three. Andrea Lee beat the crap out of her. And she got beat by Nina Nunes, the former Nina Ansaroff, um, August of last year. Like, four in a row she's lost. Um... Yeah, her back's against the wall. Back's against the wall on that one. Uh, Godinez. I don't know. She exists. Like, she's not bad, but I don't... <clears throat> she rose to a degree of prominence, taking, like, a fight on a week's notice. Or on a week's turnaround. Right? And she had her UFC debut... Okay, she loses her debut. Split decision to Jessica Penne. Tough fight. Beat Silviana Gomez Juarez, and then, yeah, the, the very next event, seven days later, bumps up to fight Luana Carolina, loses. Um, lost to Angela Hill her last time out. Yeah, again, this is this might be like winner go home time for Cynthia Calvillo. So, um, let's see what else. I didn't talk about this too much last week, but we have officially like Piotr Jan versus Marab Dwalis really for March the March 11th card. Um, that will take place at the theater at Virgin Hotels in Vegas. Um, Jan and Dwalish really... It's a good fight. Anything else on there? Alexander Volkov and Alexander Romanov is a... That's a pretty important fight. Ooh, undercard on that one. Saeed Nurmagomedov and Jonathan Martinez. Heck yes. Um, that is a... Darn good fight, actually. That better be on the main card. Like, that's... Look, Martinez, does, he's a little bit unassuming as a character. And he's had a couple of losses in the UFC that have... You know, his, his debut was not great. But after getting knocked out by Davy Grant, he was winning that fight, too, before Grant finally caught him. He's on a four-fight winning streak. I mean, he stopped Cub Swanson with leg kicks. Uh, in October of last year is his last fight. Dude kicks like a mule. And Said Nurmagomedov is 17-2 you know, and two on a four-fight winning streak. Struggled a little bit with Said Yakub Kakramanov for, that, for catching that ninja choke. But Said Nurmagomedov's the real deal. Him and Martinez, that is a very, very good fight. That might be, that's the second best fight on this card. What else do we have here? Again, Romanov and... Volkov will probably technically serve as your co-main event, but Nurmagomedov and Martinez should be in that spot. Uh, Ricardo Hamos, Austin Lingo, meh. Rafael Austin Sao and Kyler Phillips. Austin Sao should probably not be in the UFC at this point. Tyson Nam and Bruno Gustavo Da Silva. That might be fun. Lipsky and Aldrich, meh. 
Victor Henry and Tony Gravely. Dude, the Bantamweights here, man. Bantamweight almost... That's a Bantamweight heavy card. And you know what that... Dude, Bantamweights bring the heat. So, that might be a good card. That might be a really good one. Uh, let's see. Where's the other one that got something recently? Uh, oh, yeah. UFC on ESPN 43 in San Antonio, Texas. I believe they announced your main event will be a rematch between Irene Aldana and Raquel Pennington because we hate our fans. <laughs> what else we got on this one? Uh, Macy Barber and Andrea Lee. That's not bad. That's not a bad fight. Um, Holly Holm and Yana Kunitskaya. Is that a rematch? I feel like that's a rematch. It is not. Yana Kunitskaya just fought just about everybody is all. Eh. Manel Kopp and Alex Perez, actually. That's not a bad fight. Sean Brady and Michelle Pereira. That Brady, he's going to need to show some growth after his last fight. Uh, anything else on here? No, that's not a ter that's not a very good card. For an ESPN card, that is not compelling stuff. Yeah, that is that is very that is very not compelling. I mean, Chidi Inja Kawani and Albert Durayev like, they're hoping for fireworks. They might get them. That, that might have some fireworks, but, like, that's that's not a very good card. You want a main event of... Hang on. For the record. Like, you're sticking Cody Sandhagen and Marlon Vera in the Apex. But you're making people pay for Aldana Pennington 2? The UFC hates its fans. I'm half convinced. Like they just, they they get some kind of perverted pleasure out of punishing us for watching. All right. Uh, I think that's everything I've listed. Let's check Twitter, see if anything crazy is broken. If not, we will do plugs and get out of here. All right, nothing new. Sue, what do we got? What do we got? What do we got? What do we got? All righty. Uh, pretty busy this last week. I'm only going to put over, um, stuff I've already done. I covered the WWE's Royal Rumble event, which was Saturday. So if you want my full report on that, it's in the Wrestling Zone of 411 Mania. Pretty darn good event, actually. A little dead in the middle, but, uh, overall, definite positive show. Uh, as for this week, a lot of the same. Well, uh, let's see. The usual coverage, AEW's Dark Elevation on Monday, MLW on Thursday if they're airing something, and WWE SmackDown on Friday. Of course, the UFC event on Saturday. If you're interested in my thoughts on other things, then Mixed Martial Arts or Professional Wrestling. Uh, I Damn You Hollywood will be Monday. We had to shuffle the date around. Uh, this Monday at 9.30 Eastern, myself and Mark Radlitz, we, we will be reviewing the Netflix Gothic Murder Mystery. Uh... That's much more. Um, a pale blue eye. The pale, the pale blue eye. The pale blue eye. I'm pretty sure. Uh, starring Christian Bale. So my, our full thoughts on that. If you're interested, damn you, Hollywood's always a good time. If you're looking for movie reviews, Mark and I speak the truth. We don't always agree with each other, but we are not afraid to say when something is not good. When the masses, Mark, we will die on the hill. Because uh, last week when we reviewed Glass Onion, Mark and I were both fairly negative. And had to push back against the effusive praise that movie has received. So, uh, If you're interested in my thoughts on movies, give Damn You Hollywood a listen. Always appreciate that as well. All right. That's it for me. Be back here next week to review UFC on ESPN Plus 76. And we will be previewing... UFC 284, Makhachev versus Volkanovski. Heck yes. Full preview next week. Can't wait to dig into that one. Until then, thank you all as always for tuning in. Deeply appreciate it. Stay safe out there and continue to be well, be safe, and behave.